I was just informed, and I think this is a very good suggestion, that there is a book which goes into much detail on the subject of the three beings of the Godhead uh, available through Orion Publishing, as I think some of you know who's involved in that. Uh, it is called The Trinity, The Trinity, available through Orion Publishing if you need more in-depth material on the subject that I covered on the three beings of the Godhead and the eternal existence of Jesus Christ. Time has tarried over 100 years beyond the time when the Lord clearly wanted to take his people home. And that time was during the lifetime of those who had personally experienced the revivals of the 1840s. During their lifetime, he wanted to take them home. They knew well the foundations, the landmarks of Adventism. Now they are all gone. All those people are gone including the prophetic voice, that's gone too. And today we keep on looking for reasons for the painful and embarrassing delay. It is embarrassing because we have said he's coming soon for a hundred years. Since the basis for this church's foundation is in Daniel and Revelation, we have gone back to those books to find some explanation for the delay. Some believe that we have been using the wrong method of interpreting those books. That a better method will enable us to better prepare the way for Christ to return. One writer suggests that we must know the time, not the date of his coming, but a, the series of events leading up to his coming. And he quotes Christ's Object Lessons 127. In every age there is a new development of truth. And he says there will be special light for God's people as they near the closing scenes. What is this new light that we're talking about now? It has become very popular to advocate a dual application of the prophecies in Daniel and Revelation. Since Matthew 24 gives us an example of dual fulfillment to both Jerusalem and the end of the world with the suggestion that the day-year principle applied up to 1844, but now we're dealing with a day-equals-day principle after 1844. Since the historical approach has failed to produce the latter rain, we need a new method of interpreting the prophecies. That is the claim. Once again, my friends, truth is at the bottom of these attempts to reinterpret prophecy. History is going to be repeated. The history, the events of the Middle Ages, which took centuries to develop, will be compressed into a short period at the end of time, and we'll see it all over again. There are some chapters in both Daniel and Revelation that have not received any inspired illumination in later books or in the spirit of prophecy. And so we have done our best to understand, for instance, the seals and the trumpets. Not much light in the spirit of prophecy. And without much inspired help, maybe we haven't yet plumbed to the depths of their fulfillment. We don't know for sure. My concern is not with those issues, history being repeated, or the total and full meaning of the seals and the trumpets. My concern is with those prophecies of Daniel and Revelation which have had clear fulfillments in history and are now being given a second, more important application in the future and reapplying the day-year principle to the day-day principle in the future. Those are the two issues that I am concerned with. Let me say them again. The prophecies of Daniel and Revelation which have had clear fulfillments in history and are now being applied in the future in a more important meaning in the future and reapplying the day-year prophecies to day-day time in the future. Let's take a look now at the book of Daniel for a moment. Daniel chapter 2, and I would like to have us look at it together, spend a little time in it. Daniel chapter 2. Look at verse 36. We're not looking at the dream now. We're looking at the interpretation of the dream. Verse 36. This is the dream, and we will tell the interpretation thereof before the king. 
So now we're dealing with interpretations. We want to know what the divine interpretation is. And then the rest of the chapter deals with the meaning of the dream and gives some descriptions of what those kingdoms will be. Now turn over to Daniel chapter 7. Another vision. Different kind of vision this time. Daniel chapter 7, verses 15 and 16. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. I came near unto one of them that stood by and asked him the truth of all this. So he told me and made me know, he made me know the interpretation of the things. This is the one who will tell Daniel what it means. And if you look down in verse 28, hitherto is the end of the matter. That's very interesting. Hitherto is the end of the matter. After it has been explained in the seventh chapter of Daniel, hitherto is the end of it all. All right? Now look at chapter 8, where it gets more specific. Chapter 8, verse 15. And it came to pass, when I, even I, Daniel, had seen the vision and sought for the meaning, then, behold, there stood before me as the appearance of a man. And I heard a man's voice between the banks of Uli, which called and said, Gabriel, make this man to understand the vision. To understand the vision. What does the vision mean? And then it goes on and it describes what this vision was all about. And it describes Media and Persia and Grecia, which is the same thing that had been done in previous chapters. So it's all consistent. Over to chapter 9, verse 23. At the beginning of thy supplications, the commandment came forth, and I am come to show thee, for thou art greatly beloved. Therefore, understand the matter and consider the vision. You see the point of all of these statements. God is very interested in not just giving Daniel a vision, but in helping Daniel understand the vision. Crucial that he tells Daniel what the symbols mean, not just leave Daniel floundering to figure out what they're all about. And then he specifies, he gives characteristics of the animals and of the, the, um, the, the man of Daniel 2, and he even gives them names, specific names down through history before that had ever happened. That God gives both the vision and the interpretation so that there will be no misunderstanding. Nowhere in the books of Daniel or Revelation is there a hint that this was only a preliminary fulfillment just a first fulfillment of which there would come a better, more complete fulfillment down the line. Nowhere in the many visions given to Ellen White did she, writing under the direction of the Holy Spirit, suggest that there would be a second fulfillment of these chapters in the book of Daniel. There is nothing in her writings about Iraq, about Iran, about the United States, the Soviet Union, as real fulfillments of the beast, as is being currently taught. Nothing about that at all. Only about what Daniel was told was the meaning of these visions. Medo-Persia, Greece, Rome. Nothing about what we're hearing today. So what I'm saying is that while there are a few dual fulfillments in classic prophecies, what do I mean by classic prophecies? Joel, Isaiah, even Matthew about Jerusalem at the end of time. There are no such indications in the text of Daniel and Revelation, which is apocalyptic prophecy, symbols of the end of time. It doesn't exist in the books of Daniel and Revelation. There is an important principle here that dual fulfillment needs, must have, later inspired confirmation if we're going to be sure about it. And that is the bottom line of this dual fulfillment issue. Yes, there are some dual fulfillments, but we need divine help to know for sure about them. I think it's important to note that the loud cry could have begun after 1888. Ellen White tells us so. It was the beginning of the loud cry if the message of Christ's righteousness had been accepted by his people. Ellen G. White says nothing about needing or accepting a new method of interpreting Daniel and Revelation as necessary for the loud cry. Instead, she gives many endorsements of Uriah Smith, his book Daniel and the Revelation, as containing light and truth. Now, we're not saying that every detail of Daniel and of Daniel Revelation by Uriah Smith is right. It does mean she is recommending his method, his approach, the historical approach to prophecy. 
The fact that history will be repeated does not mean that prophecy will be repeated. Yes, there are some histories that will be repeated, but it doesn't mean that the prophecies of Daniel and Revelation will also be repeated. That is an assumption. Now, the time prophecies that are most often applied to the future are the 1260 days, the 1290 days, and the 1335 days. Let's take a look at one Bible text here, which is used to support the dual fulfillment principle. Revelation chapter 13, Revelation 13, and in verse 3, Revelation 13, verse 3. You know this uh, very well. We don't have to go through the details. And I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death, and his deadly wound was healed, and all the world wondered after the beast. When did that begin to take place? During the last century, the deadly wound began to be healed, and we're still seeing the healing today. And all the world wondered after the beast. Not quite yet, is it? Not all the world. Almost all the world. Still a com more complete fulfillment yet to come on this one. Look at verse 5. And there was given unto him a mouth speaking great things and blasphemies, and power was given unto him to continue forty and two months. Now notice the ar argument here. This is said to prove that the 1260 days, that's the forty and two months, must start after the deadly wound is healed. That's the argument. Notice, notice verse 3 says the deadly wound is healed and all the world wondered after the beast. And then verse 5 says this mouth was given great power for 1260 days. So if you're reading consecutively, the healing takes place and then the 1260 days begins. That is the argument here. And it's a pretty strong argument in reading these verses. It's based on the false assumption that everything written in these prophetic chapters is chronological. Straight line. If one verse says it in verse 3, then everything after verse 3 must happen in time after verse 3. You know what that would really mean? Look down in verse 11. If that's true, if verse 3 says that uh, all of the rest of the chapter happens after the deadly wound is healed and all the world wonders after the beast, look what else happens after that happens. Verse 11. And I beheld another beast coming up out of the earth, and he had two horns like a lamb, and he spake as a dragon. Then that can't be the United States. Because the United States arose way before the healing of the wound. Right? So that means that our interpretation of this lamb-like beast is all wrong. And it is a beast yet to arise in the future, sometime during the 1260 days when the little horn is speaking great things. If Revelation chapter 13 is chronological, then all of our understanding of these prophecies are wrong. That's the problem. And that also would mean a, a, a contradiction of very clear Ellen White statements about the lamb-like beast, right? She very clearly says that is the United States, and it arose during that period from 1798, the end of the prophecy, until uh, the, the period of 1844, etc. So Ellen White is wrong, we have, our, our prophetic teaching is wrong. We have to reinterpret everything. If chapter 13 must be read in chronological order. No, the prophecies of Revelation are not chronological, which makes it more difficult to understand, of course, but that's just the way it is. They are not in chronological order in all details. Ellen White, writing in Manuscript Releases, Volume 10, page 269 and 270. Manuscript Releases, Volume 10, 269 and 270. Our position has been one of waiting and watching with no time proclamation to intervene between the close of the prophetic periods in 1844 and the time of our Lord's coming. Notice, that's 10 MR, 269 and 70. The prophetic periods closed in 1844, she says. There will be no more time proclamation. It is said that that refers only to day-year prophecies, but that again is an assumption. She says the prophetic periods closed. I take that to be all of the prophetic periods, either day-year or day-day, anything, and no more time proclamation after 1844. Here is what one Adventist futurist has said. And that's the name for this teaching, by the way, futurism. The historical approach has served us well in the past, 
but like the horse and buggy, no longer fits our needs. It is, like the horse and buggy, no longer relevant. That means that the book Daniel and Revelation by Uriah Smith, which Ellen White told the young men to do all they could to sell this book, which she said should be studied carefully by the students in our schools, is no longer relevant to our superior wisdom because the book Daniel and Revelation is the horse and buggy approach. Now, a little bit about the 1290 and the 1335 of Daniel 12. Those are kind of sticky. What are the 1290 days? What are the 1335 days of Daniel 12? A very, shall we say, confusing statement of Ellen White. Let me read it to you. We told him, an individual, of some of his errors in the past, that the 1335 days were ended and numerous errors of his. Now, that was written in 1850. Uh, that was said in 1850. You'll find it in Manuscript Releases, Volume 5, page 203. Let me read it again. We told him of some of his errors in the past, that the 1335 days were ended, and numerous errors of his. Question. Is one of his errors that the 1335 days had ended? Is that one of his errors that she told him about? Or did Ellen White tell him that the 1335 had ended? And then she talked about some other errors of his. That's the problem. It's not a good grammatical sentence. Ellen White always felt very poor in grammatical structure. And this is 1850, very early in her lifetime. She didn't do a good job with this one. Did she tell him, you see, that's the question. Did she tell him that it was an error of his, that the 1335 days had ended, still in the future, or did she tell him that the 1335 had ended and then she went on to talk about errors of his? That's the question. How do we unlock this grammatical mystery? How do we solve the puzzle? The word is we. The word is we. We told him. Who's we? James and Ellen White. They were the ones talking to this brother. What did James believe on this subject? Not hard to find. Evidences are conclusive that the 1335 days ended with the 2300 with the midnight cry of 1844. That's not hard to figure out. That's Review and Herald, January 29, 1857. January 29, 1857. 1335 ended in 1844. So there is no way, is there, that James, we, would have said that it was error to believe that the 1335 had ended. There's no way. So Ellen White has to mean that she told him of some of his errors, and she also told him the 1335 had ended. That's all I can figure out. Now, in Daniel 12, there are several key words in this very debated chapter, Daniel 12. Daily taken away, abomination, desolate, set up, various words. In Daniel 11.31, you have the same key words, take away, daily, place, which is the same as set up, abomination, desolate. Now, how does that help to solve our problem? Daniel 11.32 to 35 describes the papal reign between 538 to 1798. Daniel 11.31 describes the 1260-year period between 538 and 1798. And those words are used about that. So the linguistic evidence, the word evidence, is that the 1290 in Daniel 12 describes the same period as Daniel 1131 because it uses the same words in both cases. Daily, taken away, abomination, desolate, set up. So the 1290 must have the same reference as the 1131 statement of the 1260 years. Here's what I think. The 1260 and the 1290 tell us that God's truth will be overcome by the papacy for a time. The 1335 and the 2300 tell us when the abomination of desolation will begin to be reversed. The first two say that the papacy will make his mark, and the second two, it will be reversed by God. That's what I think it means. Again, from Ellen White. The people will not have another message upon definite time. 
After this period of time, reaching from 1842 to 1844, there can be no definite tracing of the prophetic time. The longest reckoning reaches to the autumn of 1844. That's Bible Commentary, volume 7, page 971. And I'm going to suggest that prophetic time does not mean just year for day. It means definite time. Another message upon definite time. Prophetic time and definite time mean the same thing. A definite time has a starting point and an ending point. No more messages on definite time. John Bell received two communications from Ellen White on November 8, written on November 8, 1896. I'm going to share a few of what the statements that Ellen White made to John Bell. I have not been able to sleep since half past one o'clock. I was bearing to Brother John Bell a message which the Lord had given me for him. The peculiar views he holds are a mixture of truth and error. And then she spends some time in some uh, preliminary statements. There have been one and another who in studying their Bibles thought they discovered great light and new theories, but these have not been correct. Some will take the truth applicable to their time and place it in the future. Events in the train of prophecy that had their fulfillment away in the past are made future. What was John Bell doing? He was placing the true fulfillment of the three angels' messages in the future, not in the past, not in 1842 to 1844. From the light that the Lord has been pleased to give me, you are in danger of doing the same work presenting before others truths which have had their place and done their specific work for the time in the history of the faith of the people of God. You recognize these facts in Bible history as true, but apply them to the future. They have their force still in their proper place, in the chain of events that have made us as a people what we are today, and as such they are to be presented to those who are in the darkness of error. You and other of our brethren must accept the truth of God as God has given it to his students of prophecy. From their voices and pens, the truth in bright, warm rays has gone to all parts of the world, and that which was to them testing truth is testing truth to all to whom this message is proclaimed. Well, that would include Dan Uriah Smith in his book Daniel and Revelation. Those who have set themselves to study out new theories have a mixture of truth and error combined. According to the light God has given me, you are on the wrong track. That which appears to you to be a chain of truth is in some lines misplacing the prophecies and counterworking that which God has revealed as truth. The Lord will not lead minds now to set aside the truth that the Holy Spirit has moved upon his servants in the past to proclaim. Doesn't sound like horse and buggy to me. Doesn't sound like outdated to me. Sounds like just as relevant today as it was when the words were originally written by those studying them out, our pioneers. Remember, our pioneers didn't have it all right, but they had it mostly right. Probably a lot more right than we're doing today. And here was an area where I think they were very sound in their principles of historical understanding of prophecy. There was a nice conclusion to this. Uh, A.G. Daniels wrote, John Bell has taken a splendid position on the testimony concerning his book. He has set aside his erroneous views altogether and stands in the best position I have known him at all. How oh, I wish that would be true in our situations today among the very ones who are doing the same thing as John Bell, essentially. Putting all the prophecies into the future, starting them with the National Sunday Law, then the Universal Sunday Law, and etc., going on and on. Do you know that the, the result of these attempts to reinterpret Daniel and Revelation, there is so much speculation going on. Have you checked? Hardly any two interpreters agree about the meanings of the symbols, what nations they apply to, what events they apply to, what popes they apply to, etc., etc., etc. The focus is on events and dates and popes rather than heart searching and receiving the latter rain. That's the problem. Our focus gets shifted. And there is a subtle form of time setting for Christ's return, even though everyone will deny it. Listen carefully. If the clocks begin with the Sunday laws, national and universal Sunday laws, and end with the special resurrection, which takes place perhaps just a few days before Jesus returns, 
then when the Sunday law comes, we will know the approximate time of Christ's return. That's a form of time setting. Subtle, but it's there. So I don't believe that our attention should be well spent on these attempts to reinterpret clearly defined and clearly fulfilled prophecies of Daniel and Revelation, particularly the day year pr pr uh, principle of prophecy. All right, that's the third one. Now we'll go on to the fourth one that we will consider this afternoon. Over the past decade, I have been receiving large numbers of papers, open letters, booklets on one theme, the necessity of observing the national festivals or feasts given to the Hebrews along with the Sabbath days of those feasts. Within the last three years, this has been gathering momentum among those seriously preparing for final events. Remember, those seriously preparing for final events. Much has been written and spoken on this subject. It's impossible to cover everything in one meeting, but a, there is a fair amount of technical material and, and language usage involved in this, historical practices. So what I'm going to try to do this afternoon is identify the major issues, at least enough to make decisions upon, the major issues involved here. Now, as in the case of the previous subjects, there is truth at the, base, as, uh, at the basis of these claims for the feast days. God gave Israel numerous, marvelous statements of how they were to live their lives. One of them was a sequence of observances throughout the year to teach the major lessons of the plan of salvation one by one by one, all through the year. How God was handling the great controversy. How Satan would be defeated. And every year Israel was to repeat those lessons. And a new generation would understand these issues in the great controversy and the torch of truth would be passed on to the following generations. Outstanding teaching tool that God gave to Israel in the feasts that he asked them to observe. And then because of apostasy in the Christian church and because animosity came to everything Jewish, they hated anything that was Jewish, these observances were completely forgotten in the early centuries of the Christian era. They were replaced with, guess what? Christmas and Easter and even Halloween. If Christians would have remained and would have remembered these Hebrew feasts, and their meanings, it would be very easy to understand the dual aspects of the atonement, the cross, and the final atonement. It would be easy to understand the reasons for the judgment and Christ's new work in the most holy place of the heavenly sanctuary since 1844. If Christians had been faithful in remembering the feasts, Adventists wouldn't be alone in proclaiming any of these truths. The Christian churches would have understood them. And if Seventh-day Adventists would have studied the feasts more carefully. We would not be in such confusion today about righteousness by faith, about the judgment, about the purpose of the last generation. The feasts were and are tremendous teaching tools for God's children, and they can be very useful for us today in learning about God's plan and what He has in mind. But make no mistake, those promoting the feast today are saying much more than this. New claims are the problem that I am addressing today, and I'm going to read some of these claims. Those who go through the end and are translated will be teaching the statutes and judgments. The law is the Ten Commandments and the statutes. It is also the fundamental teaching which the 144,000 must embrace if they are to give the loud cry. The antediluvians were destroyed for not keeping the statutes. And this will be the ultimate factor which brings the end destruction upon mankind. The 144,000 will teach the statutes in the last days. The statute message is the very heart of the message carried in the loud cry to the world. Now since the feasts are part of the statutes, we're being told that only feast keepers will be translated, that it is necessary to be part of the 144,000, that it is the heart of the final message to the world. 
That's much more than a teaching tool. It has now become the final test issue by which the 144,000 will receive the seal of God. That's the issue I'm addressing today. Will that be the test issue? I gave you 10 reasons earlier today. I'm now going to give you 11 suggestions to consider today on this subject of the feasts and the Sabbaths connected with them. The claim is made that the feasts were part of the heavenly sanctuary before Lucifer fell. They were observed in heaven. And they were part of the creation of the earth before sin. How do they get that? It's based on the Hebrew word moed, M-O-E-D, moed. Now the word, and that word is used to describe things in heaven and things uh, during the time of Genesis. That word moed can have a number of meanings. It can mean appointment. can mean festival or feast. It can mean assembly. It can mean congregation. It can mean appointed time, a number of meanings, depending on context. It is completely improper to assume that whenever moed is used, it refers to the feasts, Passover, Pentecost, tabernacles, because it does have different meanings in different contexts. The meaning varies according to the subject discussed, what is under discussion. The claim that since the plan of redemption existed at the foundation of the world and the feasts are, on the, are the unfolding of the plan of redemption, therefore the feasts were established at creation is an interesting logical deduction. There's just one problem. There's no inspired evidence that the feasts existed before Sinai, apart from their use of the word moed, which isn't a proof. There is no evidence. Moed cannot be used to prove their existence. The Passover began with the tenth plague in Egypt. And its purpose was to commemorate the Israelites' deliverance from slavery. Everything was tied to that point of the tenth plague in Egypt. How could it exist before that? The Day of Atonement began with the yearly cycle connected with the sanctuary. When was the sanctuary set up? At Sinai. There could be no Day of Atonement as the final cleansing of the sanctuary until the sanctuary existed with a high priest and all the rest that were connected with it. Tabernacles, the Feast of Tabernacles, pointed to the rest in Canaan after their enemies had been destroyed. That's why it was set up in place to say that there will be a time in which you will have freedom from all your enemies. And all that were connected with the Hebrew chosen people after Sinai. In other words, there's just no evidence of their existence before Moses. So the first point, there is no evidence that the feasts existed before Mount Sinai and Moses giving them to the children of Israel. Point number two, many statements from Ellen White are used to support and prove feast keeping. For instance, in these last days, there is a call from heaven inviting you to keep the statutes and ordinances of the Lord. She says that. Testimony, I'm sorry, Science of the Times, Volume 2, page 184. In the last days, a call from the Lord to keep the statutes and ordinances of the Lord. I will put my spirit within you and cause you to walk in my statutes. That's Review and Herald, Volume 5, page 83. Now the most famous statement is in Review and Herald, May 6th, 1875. You need to take a very careful look at this one. Review and Herald, May 6, 1875. In consequence of continual transgression, the moral law was repeated in awful grandeur from Sinai. Christ gave to Moses religious precepts which were to govern the everyday life. These statutes were explicitly given to guard the Ten Commandments. They were not shadowy types to pass away with the death of Christ. They were to be binding upon men in every age as long as time should last. These commands were enforced by the power of the moral law, and they clearly and definitely explained that law. All right, sounds pretty strong, doesn't it? The statutes and the ordinance, not shadowy types to pass away binding upon men as long as time should last. But notice one thing, right in this statement, the moral law was repeated from Sinai and the statutes were given to Moses to give to the people, right in that very statement. 
The statutes and judgments specifying, notice very carefully, the duty of man to his fellow men were full of important instruction, defining and simplifying the principles of the moral law for the purpose of increasing religious knowledge and of preserving God's chosen people distinct and separate from idolatrous nations. The statutes concerning marriage, inheritance, and strict justice in dealing with one another were peculiar and contrary to the customs and manners of other nations and were designed of God to keep his people separate from other nations. The necessity of this to preserve the people of God from becoming like the nations who had not the love and fear of God is the same in this corrupt age when the transgression of God's law prevails and idolatry exists to a fearful extent. If ancient Israel needed such security, we need it more to keep us from being utterly confounded with the transgressors of God's law. The hearts of men are so prone to depart from God that there is a necessity for restraint and discipline. That is a pretty strong statement about the statutes and judgments. Now let's look carefully at that whole article. First of all, she introduces the moral law, the Ten Commandments, in the first two paragraphs of that article. And then she introduces the ceremonial law, and she points out that it is clear and distinct from the moral law. And then she says there is a third category. She calls these statutes and judgments, sometimes including them in the more general term, precepts. They were not the Ten Commandments, the moral law, because they were given to guard it. They can't be the same because they were given to guard the Ten Commandments. So they are different from the Ten Commandments. They were not part of the ceremonial law. She said they were not shadowy types to pass away with the death of Christ. So the statutes were neither the moral nor the ceremonial law. Notice now what the statutes are. They were to govern the everyday life. They were the pur for the purpose of protecting life. They specify the duty of man to God and to his fellow man. They define and simplify the principles of the moral law. They apply to marriage. They apply to inheritance. They apply to strict justice in business affairs. They were to keep the people from following the customs of other nations. They were to be binding upon all men in all ages as long as time should last. So she tells us that they are not the moral law, not the ceremonial law, but they are explaining, applying, and enforcing the moral law. Where did she find these statutes and judgments? Well, you can read it in Exodus 21.1 and onward through 23.11, right after the Ten Commandments were given, where it explains these various marriage laws, inheritance laws, justice, duty of man to his fellow man. What is interesting is that there is nothing about the three feasts in which all males were to come to Jerusalem every year into the tabernacle in those statutes that follow the Ten Commandments right there. It just isn't there. So here we have a statement now that is said to say that the statutes and judgments which include the feast are necessary for the end of time. Now here's the interesting point. If Ellen White really meant that, if she really meant that we were to have the feast to the end of time, why didn't she ever make the connection between the statutes and the feasts and say the feasts are part of the statutes? Nowhere does she do that. She never says the statutes mean the feasts. That's an interpretive deduction that they must mean that. Well, some say, well, they're clearly part of the statutes. Agreed. Let's take a, just a minute to look at statutes together. Let's see what we can find out. Leviticus chapter 7. Leviticus chapter 7. Verse 3. And he shall offer of it all the fat thereof, the rump, and the fat that covereth the inwards, and the two kidneys, and the fat that is on them, which is by the flanks, and the caul that is above the liver, with the kidneys, it shall he take away. All right, now we're describing all of these various uh, burnt offerings and all of the things here, and, and, all, and the rest of the chapter is just full of that. Go on to the end of this uh, chapter now, to verse 34. For the wave breast and the heave shoulder have I taken of the children of Israel from off the sacrifices of their peace offerings and have given them unto Aaron the priest and unto his sons by a statute forever from among the children of God. So here were offerings that were given to Aaron for their sustenance and for the priests as a statute forever. 
Okay? So there's a statute. Let's try another statute. Pardon? A 34. Leviticus 7, 34. Now to Exodus. Exodus chapter 30. Exodus chapter 30, verse 19. Exodus 30, 19. For Aaron and his sons shall wash their hands and their feet thereat. This is in the labor. When they go into the tabernacle of the congregation, they shall wash with water that they die not. Or when they come near to the altar to minister, to burn offering made by fire unto the Lord, so they shall wash their hands and their feet that they die not. And it shall be a statute forever to them, even to him and to his seed throughout their generations. So anyone who does a priestly work must wash hands and feet before going into the tabernacle of the Lord. All right? There's a statute. Let's try another one. Back to the Le book of Leviticus. This time, chapter 19. Leviticus 19, verse 27. Leviticus 19, verse 27. Ye shall not round the corners of your heads, neither shalt thou mar the corners of thy beard. Some of us have done a little more than marring the corners, haven't we? <laughs> then notice what is said in verse 37. Therefore shall ye observe all my statutes and all my judgments, and do them. I am the Lord. So, marring the corners of the beard, tampering with the way the beard grows, is a statute to be observed forever. Okay? Statutes. One more. Numbers chapter 15. Numbers 15. Verse 38. Speak unto the children of Israel and bid them that they make them fringes in the border of their garments throughout their generations and that they put upon the fringe of the borders a ribbon of blue. All right? And then look just a little farther in verse 39. And it shall be unto you for a fringe that you may look upon it and remember all the commandments of the Lord and do them that you seek not after your own heart and your own eyes. Commandment here. Which they interpret to be the same as a statute. A ribbon of blue on the borders of all of our garments. All statutes, just like the feasts, are statutes. It is suggested by those who are observing the feast days that we are to follow not the specific command of the beard and the ribbon of blue, but look for the principle behind the command. Aaron and the priests are to be supported by the offerings that people bring in. We are to keep ourselves modest in dress. We are to not go after idolatrous customs and marring the corners of our beard. That's what that was about etc. All right. I like that. We look for the principle behind the command. We look for what is meant, what the issue is, what the real thing that the Lord is getting at. Then are we to look behind the feast days for the principles of the feast days in exactly the same way? If we're going to say that all the statutes and judgments have to be fulfilled exactly as they were given to be part of the 144,000, we've got a lot of statutes to cover, my friends, that aren't being mentioned by those observing the feast days. But if we are to observe the principles for which those statutes were given, isn't that what Ellen White was referring to? Dealing justly with our fellow man, fairly, honestly, treating everyone justly? If we are to look for the principles behind the commands, then we are to learn the lessons of the feasts and practice the principles of the feasts. All right, so point number two. The statements by Ellen White regarding the statutes and judgments do not include feast days in those clear statements. That is an assumption. And the, fee and the statutes and judgments are based on principles. Point number three, Ellen White said, well would it be for us to have a Feast of Tabernacles. Review and Herald, November 17, 1885. November 17, 1885. She said, shall we not gather our forces together and come up to the Feast of Tabernacles?
Therefore, come to the camp meeting, even though you have to make a sacrifice to do so. Bible Echo, Bible Echo, December 8, 1893. This happened to be a camp meeting in December in Australia, which is a good time for camp meetings in December. A camp meeting in December. And that is not October, my friends, when October, when the Feast of Tabernacles is to be observed. She called it a Feast of Tabernacles as a camp meeting. Not a commemorative event here, but an evangelistic event to tell the people about what we believe. Come up to the feast, come up to the camp meeting, and we will have a great evangelistic meeting. That's what Ellen White was saying. Another one. Then shall your life henceforth be a continual feast of tabernacles, a continual thank offering. That's Manuscript Releases, Volume 18, page 270. What is her point here? Point number three, Feast of Tabernacles is about camp meeting and blessing and thanksgiving. Principle of the Feast of Tabernacles. Point number four, since it is very clear that Ellen White did not observe the feasts and the annual Sabbaths during her lifetime, some explanation is necessary as to why God's end-time prophet did not understand something necessary for translation again. And here is what one has suggested. The Holy Spirit did not allow Daniel to fully understand what he wrote. The same happened to Mrs. White with God's festivals. Wow, Daniel is dealing with sealed prophecies to be understood 2,300 years later. So Daniel wasn't expected to know. And God says, it isn't your business right now. While Ellen White is explaining those prophecies and writing much about the statutes and the ceremonial law and the moral law. God just left the point out there for Ellen White. I don't think that comparison works too well. For Ellen White, feasts equal. Holy convocations equal camp meetings. You'll find a little more of that in Testimonies, Volume 6, page 70. There is nothing in her writings about appointed times for the convocations or the feasts, a set time, a set day of the year. And then another explanation for why she didn't know. Like Luther was not given the Sabbath, Ellen White was not given all the light on God's feasts. Hmm. Clear admission, by the way, of a lack of evidence for the feast in the spirit of prophecy. Ellen White was not given all the light on God's feast. Luther was in great, great darkness. He didn't have the light on many subjects. He understood only a few subjects clearly. Praise the Lord for what he did understand. Is Ellen White a prophet of God for the final generation as blind as uninspired Luther regarding tests for the seal of God? That's the comparison that is being made. She didn't know any more than Luther on some things. As in our other subjects, the name of God, the Trinity, futurism, the claim is made that Ellen White just did not understand. We have more light than she had. We must go farther than the inspired mouthpiece for God to learn God's will for us today. We know more than the prophet. That's point number four. Since Ellen White did not know, therefore we have to add to what she said, is their claim. Point number five. The claim is made that Jesus kept the annual feasts. Here's a statement used to prove that. Jesus traveled up and down the breadth of the land. This is Ellen White. Jesus traveled up and down the breadth of the land, giving his invitation to the feast. Review and Herald, July 7. 1896. What feast? The gospel feast. The gospel invitation. That's the feast she's talking about. Check it out. It's the feast of bringing people into the light of the gospel. Desire of Ages, page 450 says, since the healing at Bethesda, he had not attended the national gatherings. His apparent neglect of the great religious assemblies. He himself seemed to be indifferent to the service which had been divinely established. He didn't observe most of the feasts. He didn't come to the feasts in Jerusalem most of the time. And then 
During the last Passover supper, Desire of Ages 652 says, the national festival of the Jews was to pass away forever. It is suggested by those who believe in the feast that this refers only to the sacrifices on the Passover day, not the feast of unleavened bread, which took place for one more week after that. But listen to Acts of the Apostles 390 and 391. Paul tarried to keep the Passover during the eight days of the feast. The eight days of what feast? Passover. Let's look up one text in the Bible here. Luke chapter 22, verse 1. Luke 22, verse 1. Now the feast of unleavened bread drew nigh. That's the seven-day feast, which is called the Passover. The feast of unleavened bread is called the Passover. Our friends are trying to say that, no, no, the Passover just refers to that one day, just the killing of the Passover lamb. It doesn't refer to the, feasts with the, the, the seven days of the feast of unleavened bread. But both in Acts of the Apostles it does, and in Luke 22 it does. The entire feast is called the Passover, well, even though the Passover meal was only eaten on the very first day the, the, of the later, it would be eight total days of this feast. So in common usage, Passover equals feast of unleavened bread equals eight days long equals the national festival of the Jews, which was to pass away forever. All right, so now point number five is that Jesus did not attend regularly the feasts of the Jews and that he said that the festival would pass away forever. Point number six. The claim is made that only the sacrifice is ended while the feast days continue. Now I want you to listen to two statements very carefully and reason your way through these two statements. For both Ellen White. After the crucifixion, it was a denial of Christ for the Jews to continue to offer the burnt offerings and sacrifices which were typical of his death. Clear statement, right? After the crucifixion, it would be a denial of Christ to offer a sacrifice for any Christian. You'll find that in Signs of the Times, July 29, 1886. July 29, 1886. No sacrifices were acceptable after Christ's death. Commenting now on the Jerusalem Council in Acts 15, she says, The council had decided that the converts from the Jewish church, Jewish church, might observe the ordinances of the Mosaic law if they chose, while those ordinances should not be made obligatory upon converts from the Gentiles. Principle there, the Jewish converts could continue to observe the ordinances, while the Gentiles should not be required to do that. She'll find that in Sketches from the Life of Paul, page 121. Now, this statement cannot refer to the sacrifices, because that it was done when Christ died. No Jew or Gentile was ever to offer a sacrifice again, pointing forward to the Lamb of God. That would be a denial of faith. Jew, Gentile, any Christian. Sacrifices had ended at the cross. But... The other ordinances of the Mosaic Law could be observed by Jewish converts if they wanted to, but they weren't necessary. What ordinances would they include? The feast days, among the other ordinances given to the Jews. That rules out the sacrifices, you see. Sacrifices that ended at the death of Christ. Now, permission is given for some, if their conscience convicts them, if they want to, to observe the feast days. But the Gentiles, not at all. And it wasn't even binding upon the Jews. That's what she's saying. If they chose, they could observe those feast days, but not necessary. Wouldn't you think that if it were crucial that something would have been said at the council in Acts 15 about the necessity of the feast days? They weren't mentioned. Nothing there about the necessity at all. So point number six is that Feasts after Christ's death were optional, not necessary, and certainly not for Gentiles. Point number seven. 
Paul did keep the Passover with converts at Philippi. You'll read that in Acts 20, verse 6. And Pentecost is mentioned as well. Why? Why was Paul keeping Passover? For the same reason, he took a purification vow in the temple. Let's read about it. Acts chapter 21, verse 24. Acts 21, 24. Got him into some trouble, as you remember the story. But he did it for a very specific reason. Acts 21, verse 24. These are four men which have a vow, and Paul is encouraged to complete the vow with them. Then take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them, that they may shave their heads, and all may know these, that those things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing. What were they informed? Paul doesn't keep the laws of Moses. But that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. Why did they advise Paul to do that? So the accusation could be forever refuted but that the Jews were making against Paul that he was anti-law. And so they said, you don't have to do this. We know you don't have to do this. You are not bound by it, but it would be a good thing to do to, to make evangelism among the Jews a little easier. That's what they were saying in Acts 21, verse 24, to reach the hearts of faithful Jews. Now remember, the council had decided that the Jewish converts could keep the Mosaic law if they chose. That was legitimate. So Paul, in coming to Philippi, kept the Passover with Jewish and Gentile converts as a sign of unity. It was optional. It could be done. The Jewish converts were very strong in that city, apparently, that it should be done. And Paul says, it's not an issue of conscience. I will keep the Passover. And he did it with Jews and Gentiles together because now we are not Jews or Gentiles. We are Christians. And this can be a sign of unity. It is not a denial of faith. You see, the years 34 to 70 A.D. were a transition time between the Jewish laws and customs and the Christian observances, and there was some overlapping here that took place. And Paul kept some Jewish laws which were not mandatory after the death of Christ because he wanted to be a Jew to the Jews. He wanted to be able to reach their hearts. We can read that. He's specific on it. 1 Corinthians, 1 Corinthians chapter 9, Verses 19 and 20. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verses 19 and 20. For though I be free from all men, yet have I made myself servant unto all, that I might gain the more. And unto the Jews I became as a Jew, that I might gain the Jews. To them that are under the law, as under the law, that I might gain them that are under the law. That's why I went through the purification ceremony. That's why he kept the Passover and Pentecost, trying to reach the hearts of faithful Jews and not raise stumbling blocks that would prevent them from hearing the message of Christ's life and his death. So point number seven, Paul keeps the Passover as a way to keep the Christian church in unity and reach the hearts of the Jewish brethren. Point number eight, our Seventh-day Adventist pioneers on this subject were all agreed. J.N. Andrews, when that city was destroyed, the complete cessation of their feasts and as a consequence of the annual Sabbaths, which were specified days in these feasts, must occur. Complete cessation. The Jewish festivals were utterly extinguished with the final destruction of Jerusalem. Notice the destruction of Jerusalem, not 34 A.D., but when there was no longer a national city and land anymore. That's when they came to an end completely. That's in his book, History of the Sabbath, page 90. Joseph Bates, when their feasts cease to be binding on them, these Sabbaths must also. Uriah Smith, the feast days, new moons, and ceremonial Sabbaths were to cease at the cross. James White, new moons, feast days, and Sabbaths of the Jewish law ceased. So our brothers and sisters are going to have to say they were wrong on that point because they are united on the point that the, the feast ceased at the destruction of Jerusalem, our pioneers. Point number nine. There are three primary feasts which were required to be observed at the temple, all males to the temple. 
they could not be observed in captivity in Babylon because they couldn't come to the temple. They were closely tied, in addition to that, to the Israelite agricultural calendar, different than ours. Every few years they added the 13th month to the 12 months to keep the harvest cycle rotating correctly throughout the year. They didn't have our solar cycle, they had a lunar cycle. And that meant it would just go off a few days every year until you'd be having harvest in completely different months and that would confuse everything. And so every few years a 13th month was added to get, get the harvest cycle back in balance. A leap month, that's exactly what it was. And that could not be kept in captivity because they weren't into the barley harvest and all of the rest of the harvests. So, in, and you read about that in Hosea chapter 9, verses 3 to 5. So, the feasts were tied to the temple and to the agricultural calendar. How can we keep them in the United States? Three times a year up to the temple. What temple? And how do we get the, fee, the, uh, the, the cycle in place about the harvest cycle? How can we keep them in the United States, literally? Point number 10. There is a distinction between the Sabbaths of the feast and the Seventh-day Sabbath in Leviticus 23. Let's take a quick look at that. Leviticus chapter 23. Leviticus 23, verse 2. Speak unto the children of Israel and say unto them, Concerning the feasts of the Lord, and this is that word moed, the feasts, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, even these are my feasts. All right? And then in verse 3, it talks about the Sabbath, the seventh day Sabbath. And then following verse 3 and verse 4, then the feasts are, are listed, all the different feasts that are needed to be observed. So it is said, well, there you have it. The Feast of the Lord includes the Seventh-day Sabbath and all of the feasts together. Right in that passage, notice the difference in verse 3 about the Sabbath. How much work should be done on the Sabbath? No work. No work. It is the Sabbath of the Lord. Go down a little bit farther here uh, to verses... Um, well, let's see. What is, what is the easiest one here to, to look at? Well, any one. You can choose any one here. Uh, right here in verse uh, 7. The first day of the holy convocation of the Passover. What kind of work? Servile work. Ordinary work. The regular work. You could do some work, but not the taxing work. Not the hardest work. Not the, 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 the extra work. There's a difference. No work and servile work. And if you will notice, as you go down through these feasts, all of them refer to servile work. Now go with me to verse 37. Verse 37. These are the feasts of the Lord, which ye shall proclaim to be holy convocations, to offer a burnt offering, I'm sorry, to offer an offering made by fire unto the Lord, a burnt offering and a meat offering, a sacrifice and drink offerings, everything upon his day, beside the Sabbaths of the Lord and beside your gifts which ye give unto the Lord. Beside the Sabbaths of the Lord. The word Sabbaths of the Lord is never used of the feast days. It is only used of the seventh day Sabbath. And if you go back and look at verse 3, it is the Sabbath of the Lord in all your dwellings. And no nowhere is that used about the feast days, and it explicitly says that the feast days are beside the Sabbaths of the Lord, in addition to the Sabbaths of the Lord, not the same as. So the word moed is different. Feasts are different from the Sabbaths of the Lord. So in Leviticus 23, there is a distinction between Sabbaths and Sabbath in the words used to describe them. That's point number 10. One more point, point number 11. The claim is made that the feasts can be separated from the sacrifices. You can keep the feasts without the sacrifices. There is a Hebrew word, chag, which is one of the words by which all the feasts are called. All the feasts are called by that name. It literally refers to the sacrificial victim. You can see that in Exodus chapter 23, verse 18. Exodus 23, verse 18. 
is the word that is used here. It says, Thou shalt not offer the blood of my sacrifice, hog in Hebrew, with leavened bread. Neither shall the fat of my sacrifice remain until the morning. So the word refers to the sacrificial vi victim. That word which is used to feast refers to the sacrifices of the feast in the same way. It implies that the feasts are simply extensions of the sacrificial animals. They're extensions of it. They flow out of the sacrifice. Could then we truly observe the feast without the sacrifices? So that's point number 11. The feasts and the sacrifices are intimately connected together, one with the other. Those are my suggestions for issues that have to be considered when you're making a decision about whether you will be a feast keeper today. You will have to come to grips with those issues and decide what the will of the Lord is. While the study of the feast teach valuable lessons about the plan of salvation, and time is well spent in studying them in depth to make them a test of obedience on the same level as the seventh-day Sabbath is placing man-made laws above the law of God. In the same way that the Sunday tradition usurps the authority of the lawgiver. I know that strong language. Any human rule that is not clearly stated in inspiration is stealing the glory from God and exalting human reason. Life or death issues do not need inferences drawn from words and possible meanings. God always makes them crystal clear. We don't have to be scholars of the first order to learn about life and death issues. Yes, the feast days are important, but they are not the test for the seal of God and the 144,000 in these days. Conclusion. It is not coincidence, I don't think, that several unrelated issues are coming together in the belief system of some Seventh-day Adventists. Number one, only the Hebrew names for God and Christ may be used. Number two, the Holy Spirit is not a person and Christ was generated or born from the Father. Number three, the future applications of the prophecies are important, those prophecies already fulfilled in the past. Number four, the keeping of the feasts and the Sabbaths connected with them. Faithful Adventists may be very frustrated with the long delay in the final events and with the continuing decline in the visible remnant church today. There must be some new light which will hold the key to revival and reformation and will begin the final countdown to the second coming. And just like with all these things happening around us these days, God foresaw this very thing and warned us about this tendency. You'll find it in the Ellen White 1888 materials, page 1752. Very many will get up some test that is not given in the Word of God. We have our tests in the Bible, the commandments of God and the testimony of Jesus Christ. Here are they that keep the commandments of God and have the faith, faith of Jesus. This is the true test, but many other tests will arise among the people. They will come in in multitudes, springing up from this one and that one. There will be a continual rising up of some foreign thing to call attention from the true test of God. Did God see our time? Did he warn us before it ever happened? Another one. Review, this one is Ellen White, 1888 Materials, page 1752. If you happen to have the General Conference bulletins in your house, it's April 16, 1901. Another one from Review and Herald, May 29, 1888. Review and Herald, May 29, 1888. Erroneous ideas will be brought into the work and presented as a part of the truth to the people. But everything that God has not connected with the truth will only serve to weaken the message and lessen the force of its claims. They choose to follow their own course until the third angel's message becomes a thing of minor importance and finally it loses all its value. Remember the very first statement? 
I read that there will be a breach between those who bring in new tests and the third angel's message. She says that finally the third angel's message will lose its value. The doctrine of truth will be mingled with error and the result will be that those who are taught will cherish error as they do the truth. It will be more difficult to reach and correct their errors than to bring a company into the truth from the darkness of complete ignorance of the truth. It would have been better if they had not heard this mingling of the truth with falsehood. More harm can be done by one who has a mixture of truth and error than many who teach the whole truth can undo and correct. There were those in Paul's day who were constantly dwelling upon circumcision. That was their test in Paul's day. And they could bring plenty of proof from the Bible to show its obligation on the Jews. Notice that statement. They could bring plenty of proof from the Bible to support circumcision as necessary for Christians. Are we getting plenty of proof from those who believe in these teachings from the Bible? Yes, we are. Instead of catching up, every new and fanciful interpretation of the Bible cling to the message. It is the third angel's message that bears the true test to the people. Satan will lead men to manufacture false tests and thus seek to obscure the value of and make of none effect the message of truth. The commandment of God that has been almost universally made void is the testing truth for this time. The commandment of God. The Sabbath of Jehovah is to be brought to the attention of the world. All man-made tests will divert the mind from the great and important doctrines that constitute the present truth. That's what we're being faced with today. Diverting the mind. Having something else to think about. You see, Satan doesn't care in the least how he traps God's people. Whether it's worldliness, Laodiceanism, or foreign things to take our attention away from the real test for the remnant. He doesn't care. There's only one test in the Bible. Obedience to the commandments and the faith of Jesus. In other words, righteousness by faith. The gospel, as Wagoner said. Now that's not quite as glamorous or as exciting as researching names of God. Or the Trinity. Or the prophecies. Or Hebrew observances. It isn't quite as much fun. Being part of the 144,000 is all about the surrender of the heart and victory over all sin Amen. and walking daily with God as Enoch did. That's the heart of the message of our time. The 144,000 is about character more than knowledge. That's very important. More about character than about knowledge. You see, God will be able to teach us when the Holy Spirit is poured out if we have made some mistakes. I'm confident he's going to do that. So, my friends, let us keep our focus clear. Let us not be sidetracked with new light, which is either neither new nor light. I sincerely wish that I would not have had to present these subjects today. I have not presented them for 20 years because I did not want to get into negatives about what is wrong with what people believe. But this is becoming a major, major issue among faithful Seventh-day Adventists. And it is so right here in this church. And it will be wherever you go among faithful Seventh-day Adventists. You need to know what you believe and why you believe it. Not just listen to friends, not just listen to experiences, but what does God say and why does he say it? I'm going to close with prayer, and then we'll have our question time. Would you kneel with me? Gracious Father in heaven, I thank you so much that you have a people in mind to give the message of the loud cry to a world which is in darkness. I thank you that you have given us the opportunity to be part of that people part of the last generation. Right now, Lord, as we have looked at some of those tests which faithful Adventists are being asked to believe, help us to be clear discerners of the Word of God. Help us to know how to rightly divide the Word of Truth. Give us wisdom and discernment, the great gift that is lacking so much today. 
Lord, help us not to be followers of men, followers of ideas, but only followers of your word explicitly stated in your inspired messages. May we have faith, Lord. May we have faith in your word. May we not go outside of your word for knowledge. May we not look to human reasonings, but only to your word and what it says. Thank you, Lord. Thank you for giving us ability to think, to choose, to reason, and to decide. May we use those gifts to the honor and glory of God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit is my prayer. Amen.